Allen Lund Company, 47 years young and a proud sponsor, wishes OOIDA all the best as you celebrate 50 years. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. It's good news, bad news when it comes to the spot market. The bad news, it appears we finally hit bottom when it comes to rates and load posts. But the good news is that there's only one way to go, and that's up and conditions may be showing some signs of life. The OOIDA Foundation market report for June is out. The Foundation's Andrew King fills us in. It's been a busy week in the news with information breaking about automatic emergency braking, a new DOT number scam, Julie Sue's nomination to be labor secretary, and more. Ashley Blackford reviews the week in news with Mark Schremer and Ryan Witkowski of Landline Magazine. And finally, a tentative deal for one company and talk of filing for bankruptcy for another. Ashley speaks with DAT's chief of analytics about the current status of UPS and Yellow and how it's all impacting the freight market. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. Our top story today, autonomous technology and autonomous vehicles were in the spotlight at a House hearing on Wednesday. It's been a while since Congress has addressed the issue. This was the first hearing related to autonomous vehicles in over a year. The goal, to make progress on legislation that would provide oversight for the industry, especially since bills with that exact goal in mind have been held up in Congress for more than six years now. Trucking was a point of focus at several times over the course of the hearing. There were questions about what happens to professional truckers if and when autonomous trucks take over the industry. Dr. Philip Copeman, associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University, was a witness at the hearing. He said things are inevitably going to change, but it's going to take a while. Yes, I think there are. I I think it's important to recognize that this is not a you wake up the next morning and all of a sudden all the truckers are out of job. That's not going to happen. And I see see, see other witnesses nodding along. It's not going to happen. This is going to take years to play out. That doesn't mean, as was mentioned earlier, this is a 20, 30 year perspective. I, I get that eventually we'll get there, but it's not an overnight thing. So the aging out of the, of the current workforce also factors in. But the, the big thing here is, yes, the jobs will be changed, and it's going to be important to make sure those lurk workers land on their feet with other jobs, such as I mentioned before, in the back room, helping uh, intervene when there's a problem on the road, making sure that the safety is there, uh, more highly trained technicians, because now if the LIDAR, if the LIDAR doesn't work, somebody could die. Coatman expanded on that idea of job losses in a separate answer in response to a question about job losses in trucking. Uh, some examples are, uh, we heard earlier that if there's a, a problem in the middle of the ride, which uh, my friends tell me this is happening regularly, that there's a remote staff to help people out. Well, those are jobs that, that are going to be created that aren't there now. Uh, another one is going to be higher skilled technicians and higher skilled safety drivers, because every new software release, which will happen monthly or weekly, basically forever, needs testers to make sure it's safe before it's put out in the wild. Another one is some of the jobs will will be there but change in nature. Somebody still has to babysit a hazardous load even if the truck is driving itself. Someone's got to be there to unload, unload the crates until that part gets automated. So I think there's a lot of different opportunities, but they're a little bit different than just a driver behind the wheel. It was clear from the witnesses and lawmakers who spoke during the hearing that the appetite to foster more growth in the autonomous industry is there, but the concerns greatly outweighed the solutions during this week's hearing. And without a regulatory framework in place, there's only so much growth that can take place. In a bid to raise cash, Yellow is looking to sell off its third-party logistics business. In a statement, the embattled trucking company said it's in talks with multiple parties at the moment. The Wall Street Journal has reported that Yellow is preparing to file for bankruptcy protection. The carrier is buried in debt and negotiating with the Teamsters Union on a new contract. The forecasters are mostly in agreement when it comes to the spot market. They think we finally hit the bottom. Reports from CAS Information Systems, DAT and ACT Research all say that the freight market has nowhere to go but up right now. The OIDA Foundation came to basically the same conclusion in its June report, says analyst Andrew King. Yeah, I would say I would agree that uh, we definitely have hit the bottom. Um, We seem to be kind of bouncing along that bottom for a while. I think uh, not this month, but the previous month, that was kind of our... Um, title of the of the report because it seems like we've kind of hit that that floor 
where rates aren't really dropping any lower. They might here or there, you know, a few cents per mile, um, but they seem to be staying kind of steady uh, on on an average. And so I would absolutely agree that we're there at the bottom. And there are signs of improvement as well, King says. One example being that the gap between the spot and contract rates is slowly narrowing. We'll get into what else the OID Foundation's June report turned up a little later on in today's program. A port of entry that's been close to commercial traffic on the U.S. southern border for more than six years is reopening soon. U.S. Customs and Border Protection says officers will begin processing commercial traffic at the Marcelino Serna port of entry starting August 7th. Limited traffic led to the initial shutdown in May of 2017, but customs officials in Mexico are expecting that to change following the reopening of a toll road in northern Chihuahua State. They were the ones who asked the U.S. to reopen the Marcelino Serna port of entry. The cargo facility will initially be open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Trade officials anticipate that as many as 300 trucks a week will initially use the port once service resumes. The truck driver who was attacked by a police dog in Ohio earlier this month is explaining his side of the story. In an interview with ABC News, 23-year-old Jadarius Rose admits he led police on a chase that spanned across three counties over a 30-minute period. But Rose said he initially stopped and only took off once he saw police in his mirrors with their guns drawn, then called 911, fearing for his life. I just didn't want to die. That was what was going through my mind. I just didn't want to die. That's why I called them for help. When the chase ended, a police officer released his canine officer on Rose, who was unarmed and had his hands raised at the time. When a dog was released, I just was hoping that it didn't rip off my arm. And I just was like, I was defenseless. Because if I would have tried to defend myself, that would have gave them more of a reason to shoot me. I, I just wanted my life. And they, they didn't try to get the dog off of me, like, at all. I had to tell the dog to stop. I asked the dog, please, I asked the dog, please stop. It hurts. And he finally let go. Rose was hospitalized with bite injuries and later charged with a fourth-degree felony for failing to comply. His attorney, Ben Crump, said Rose is still facing those criminal charges. The police officer who released his canine partner has been fired. Rose was first pulled over because he was missing a mud flap on his trailer. Excessive heat across the country continues to pose problems for just about everyone it touches and, in some cases, everything. Minnesota's Department of Transportation recently tweeted out two pictures of pavement buckles they say are happening all over the state. One was on I-94 in Moorhead, the other on an unidentified highway. The DOT said buckles happen when a segment of road doesn't have enough space to contract or expand. Old or weak highways are most prone to buckles. Minnesota is just one of many states dealing with excessive heat warnings this week. Kansas drivers could experience delays into next week. SpaceX superloads are moving across the state as we speak, topping out at speeds of 45 miles an hour. That's expected to clog up the traffic flow. The superloads are headed down to Texas. The Kansas DOT says they'll be exiting the state on August 1st. And finally, earlier this week, we told you about the search for the sexiest trucker in Kentucky and Indiana, and the results are in. After 53,000 votes were cast for the dozens of truckers who were nominated, Justin Castle of Boots Trucking came out on top. He got nearly 11,000 votes in WBKR Radio's She Thinks Her Trucker's Sexy Photo Contest. Castle was nominated by his wife, who said he does everything in his power to make sure he provides for her and their children, and that nothing is sexier than that. As winter, Castle won a two-night stay at the Rough Rider Dam State Resort Park. And that's Landline Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. Next, we'll take a look at the spot market with Andrew King of the OOIDA Foundation. We'll be right back. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. You trust PrePass for more bypasses? Now let PrePass help with tolls. PrePass toll service means lower cost. One invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Created by truckers for truckers. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Attention all truckers. Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it. They're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. 
Welcome back to the program and welcome back to our monthly look at the spot market, the conditions affecting it and a possible preview of things to come. Our insights and wisdom today come via Andrew King of the OID Foundation, as they always do, which just put out its June report. Andrew, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for speaking with us, as always. We always learn something every time we talk to you. And I want to ask you off the bat here about the overall picture, uh, because we've been talking for, what, I guess months now about this freight recession, looking for signs that we've maybe hit bottom with hopes that we can, you know, start to crawl out of all of this. Um, We did speak with Jason Miller of Michigan State University recently. He believes that we have finally hit bottom and the conditions hopefully are going to start improving here. So I'm going to ask you kind of along those lines, based on what you're seeing there, based on the OID Foundation report, is there room for optimism? Yeah, I would say I would agree that uh, we definitely have hit the bottom. Um, We seem to be kind of bouncing along that bottom for a while. I think uh, not this month, but the previous month, that was kind of our... Um, title of the of the report because it seems like we've kind of hit that that floor where rates aren't really dropping any lower. They might here or there, you know, a few cents per mile, um, but they seem to be staying kind of steady uh, on on an average. And so I would absolutely agree that we're there at the bottom. As far as the other part, which is what everyone wants to know, is when will the market turn up again? Uh, I'm not, you know, there's there's kind of two different camps. There's one that that thinks that the market will turn up here in uh, uh, fall as the back to school shopping and stuff. Usually, that's the peak season for shipping for freight. And there's some who think that we'll be able to turn the corner then, um, because enough capacity will have left the industry that that will take care of some of the demand supply problem. But then you have the other camp, like uh, Jason Miller, the other analysts who think that it's going to be a slow, steady go of things, and it won't really start changing until 2024, um, either the second quarter, some have said the first quarter, and then and then some think it would be even longer. So it's kind of a wait and see who's right. Yeah, and it's anybody's guess as to who who might who who that might be and and what right looks like. I guess right now, um, you know, just looking at the numbers in your June report, um, there, I mean, quite frankly, isn't a lot of room for optimism. We're going to look at the different load types here that you've uh, you've gone over, and we'll start with Van here, where load posts still down, rates still down. The overall state of the dry van market, as you see it, Andrew, uh, pretty much the same kind of, as you said, they're skidding or, or bouncing around the bottom there. Yeah, for sure. And, and it helps if you, if someone were to actually go and download the report and you can see the graph, it's really helpful to see kind of the trend of where things are going. You see this this steady incline starting in April of 2020, and it, it really has this massive peak at the beginning of 2022. And then since then, we've really been in kind of this free fall and where, where we would say the freight recession probably took place starting in the beginning of the, the third quarter of last year. And, and who knows, you, you might be able to make a case that it even started before then. Um, but you'll see that it's kind of hit this bottom and it's starting to move up just a little bit. So the van low to truck ratio increased 3.6% month over month to 2.59, which really, you know, is, is, is pretty low overall considering um, when you look at the, the longer term trend, it's, it's 33% lower year over year and 31% lower than the five-year trend. So it's still really low, but it's, it is starting to pick up just a little bit. And, and the other thing that we're really looking for, uh, the thing that I'm looking for to see if the market is really turned is when you, when you look at the rates, and again, the graph here is, is so helpful. Um, because you can see the contract rate and the the spot rate, and then there's these gray bars that show the distance between the two, and they have been hovering over 50 cents a separate between contract rates and spot rates for over a year. Yeah, and that really has to shrink before we really start to see rates turn. And so it, it there was a little positive sign there that. Um, the difference between the spot and the contract is now uh, dropped seven cents to forty eight cents per mile, but that's still <laughs> that's still a lot. So right now, uh, spot rates are sitting at at two oh eight. 
um, in contract at 256, and we really need to see those numbers come closer together. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the graph because I'm looking at it right now, and you do see, uh, you know, the disparity, the difference between the two, uh, and you do see both of them, contract rates and spot rates, going down. But as you mentioned there in June, if you look at the the graph there, you see a bit of an uptick in the spot rates whereas contract rates uh, appear to, to keep going down yeah. there. And what we need, right, as you kind of alluded to there, is an equalization of those two numbers, and that is going to bring us, um, you know, uh, into a better situation for, for people that do to depend on the spot market, right? Oh, yeah, exactly. And you can see that historically because the graph goes back five years, and if anyone remembers, 2019 was really a bad year. Mm -hmm. And you can see the same kind of dynamic taking place where contract rates were very high above spot rates. And then when things change in the second half of 2020, and we had this amazing run where it just seemed to be always increasing all the time, and we had these sky-high rates, you can see that those two lines are really close to each other. And at times, um, even the spot rate will exceed contract rates, which yeah. is definitely going to pull everything up. And so that's what we're looking to happen again. Um, now, what might cause that is kind of maybe the debate among analysts. What What is actually going to make that change happen? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, you know, and speaking of, of spot and contract rates, looking at the flatbed market, uh, the difference there, according to your report, is uh, was 56 cents in June. So we are above 50 cents in terms of the difference there. Uh, and then when you look at the flatbed market as a whole, uh, not really encouraging in terms of where things are there, right, with um, spot yeah. rates, load posts, and everything put together. Yeah, that one, you know, at the beginning of this year, it was kind of the lone right spot, or yeah. at least the spot that wasn't so wasn't as worse as the other two. Um, but it's it's coming down, and, and that's kind of somewhat typical for this time of year, Um uh, movements for machinery and steel, uh, that can, they kind of tend to peak around March and April. And so we're, it's kind of starting to move into that seasonality where this is really not the best year or best time for freight in general. Um, right after the fourth, things kind of dip down. But yeah, it's, it's really looking bad, uh, a little bleak for, for flatbed haulers, especially with uh, you know, housing starts have, have ticked up a little bit. They've, they've recovered a, a somewhat, yeah. um, but they're still low overall, and that kind of helps drive some of the, the freight. Um, and even construction, you know, a lot of highway construction and things like that, you know, you have big things of machinery being moved and other things, and even that has kind of slowed down a little bit. So it's, it's looking a little bleak uh, on the flatbed side. Yeah. Um, for the load-to-truck ratio, it's, it's 60% lower and it was last year. That's that's pretty massive. Um, yeah. It is down to nine point six eight, whereas as last year it was thirty seven, uh, almost like thirty seven and a half uh, loads per one truck, which is just unbelievable. And so you can see how far we have fallen, and that's really hurting the rates. Indeed it is. Uh, let's shift real quick here to reefer. Perhaps some room for optimism there, it appears. What stands out to you there? Yeah, that is starting to pick up a little bit. Um, some of the initial problems that we're having at the beginning of the year, like we've talked about quite a bit the last few times we've gotten together, um, you know, California had a lot of issues with the rain, and that really delayed a lot of planning. And so now things are starting to pick up not just in California, but other parts of the country, depending on what kind of produce you're talking about. And so that's kind of elevated rates a bit. In fact, if you go to USDA's um, site, they do volumes for re refrigerated freight, and it has really picked up here in the last uh, month or two. So that's kind of helped in that regard. And so you can, again, it, it looks very identical. If someone were to download this, and I highly recommend that they do, and they look at the graph, and you can see where we've been historically and where we are now. And that really, more than what the numbers are themselves, is most important because it, it can let you know: Are we staying flat? Are we going down? Are we going up? Um, but the the van or the the reefer load to truck ratio uh, increased five point eight percent month over month to three point eight three. So it's starting to pick up. It's had a couple months of increases, but it's still forty six percent lower than where we were last year. But that has had a, a positive impact on rates um, over the last couple of months. Spot rates have increased, 
Uh, and so that is also starting to narrow the gap between contract and spot is the lowest for reefer. It's sitting at 41 cents per mile, a difference between the two. And so that's a very positive thing. And so at the beginning of this year, I'd say reefer was probably the worst of the three. And it might be sitting at the best spot right now of the, the other uh, three modes. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, as we kind of start to put a bow on this conversation, as we look at all of the June numbers that have come in, I hear you talking. I hear everybody else talking out there uh, about the economy. It's moving along. The recession fears have, for the most part, uh, gone away here, at least for the time being, even though inflation, of course, is still a, a big flashing concern right now. But overall, again, the economy moving along, pretty resilient in the face of all these pressures. However, as we're talking about here, as we obviously see out there, the trucking industry uh, still under this sort of huge rain cloud uh, at the moment. As we look to the future here, and you kind of gave you know different viewpoints as to where we might be headed um, you know, what is it going to take, I guess, for us to get back on track and get to that point where everybody is uh, feeling less pressure from, from everything that's, that's bearing down on us right now? What do we need to be looking for? Sure. There's, there's kind of like one or two things. Uh, one is a, a big uptick in demand, um, which probably is not going to happen. Um, you, you mentioned the inflation, though, depending on which type of inflation you're looking at. There's different types of CPIs. There's different ways to calculate and to measure them. And there's, in fact, one right now that kind of shows that we're at the level that the Fed want us to be in. And so inflation has really, it's gone down. Not that things aren't still expensive, but some things, especially like uh, energy prices, have gone down quite a bit. So I don't really see demand picking up to uh, such an extent that it could propel us out of this trough that we're in. The thing that I would look for the most is actually the capacity issue. And it seems to be always the same kind of cycle where trucking, when rates start to go up, people start to get involved more and more. They're getting more trucks and getting more drivers. And all the same time, they're, they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot in a way because eventually when the market turns, now we have all this excess capacity that we didn't have before. And that's really what you had. I mean, for 2020, 2021, and part of 2022, you have these record years. And so people were expanding their business. Now demand has, has tempered off now that the uh, the, the stimulus, uh, you know, there's three different types of, of or, uh, rounds of stimulus funding. And now that that has pretty much washed out, um, you don't really have anything driving demand anymore. So we really just need to see trucks leaving the industry. But that's also... You know, I say that, but I know that that's not a good thing. That's yeah. a pain point. That's people's businesses and their livelihoods. And so I don't mean to make light of that, but really that's what's going to have to happen. Either maybe owner operators switching to being leased on, but then in a way they're not ex actually exiting the market. That right. truck's still there. Um, but we'll need to have some type of capacity right sizing, in my view, before things really start to change. That's the thing that I'm looking for. At some point, Andrew, we're going to talk about uh, all of this, and we're going to be talking good things and positive news and positive developments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is not that day, but uh, we are all hopeful, obviously, that it will happen soon. We encourage everybody to go to the OID Foundation website and check out the report. Check out those graphs, because as you mentioned there, they really do help you understand what's going on. Andrew, we appreciate your time, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. And Landline Now is back right after this. Firestone tires are for more of everything, more miles for every tire dollar, and more confidence in your fleet. At Firestone, we help fleet save with dependable value. Find your local Firestone dealer today at firestonetire.com slash dealer. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. 
Landline now. Thank you for tuning in. We are going to take a look back now on some of the stories we've covered this week, including automatic emergency braking technology, a new scam involving DOT numbers, and the sexiest trucker in Kentucky and Indiana. The top three, I should say. Mm-hmm. Now, to discuss these topics, senior editor for Landline Magazine, Mark Schremer, and staff writer Ryan Wachowski join me. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming in. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Been looking forward to it all the last 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now, starting off with you, Mark, uh, OOIDA recently made comments to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration on AEBs. A lot of concerns with this type of technology. Can you talk to me what the proposal is and what are some of the main concerns that drivers have? Yeah. So if you just start with the proposal, um, I think it was earlier this month, NHTSA and FMCSA came out with a joint proposal. And there's varying rules and and how this would be rolled out depending on how uh, much a vehicle weighs. But basically what it would get, even class seven and eight vehicles, new vehicles, once uh, a few years down the road, they would be mandated to have this technology Basically, what the association was doing is, obviously, as you can imagine, a lot of drivers uh, are concerned about this. There have been a lot of issues with this sort of technology, whether or not false braking, all of these sorts of things. And so OIDA is going to file comments uh, later, but this was kind of like a preemptive thing to say, hey, th- this is what we're hearing from drivers. These are concerns. Um, you guys were supposed to, before you were to roll out this uh, regulation, you were supposed to consult uh, with associations like OIDA, hear what uh, drivers were having to say, and we're basically just saying, hey, listen to this. There are issues with it. A lot of drivers have complained that they're, you know, that are stopping with uh, with real no reason, and obviously, as you can imagine, uh, the concerns with, uh, you know, uh, passenger vehicles tailgating behind of what, you know. It feels problematic. <laughs> yeah, the, definitely, 100%. And that, so that that's what's happening, and, and the association is just trying to, you know, make note of that and also tell the agency, too, you just actually started an investigation on vehicles with these false braking. And so it's this weird timing for the agencies to say, hey, we got a problem. We're hearing this, that this false braking is going on, but we're going to go ahead and put out this proposal to mandate this technology anyways. Is there a deadline on comments to be made or? Yes, it is in September and September 5th is is the deadline. So, you know, got about a month still to get those out. I think that there have already been several hundred, but obviously the time is now to get those in and to let the regulators know what what drivers think about it. I've, I've spoken to drivers who like this technology, some, some young drivers, but... You know, a big part of this is there's a lot of drivers out there that I've talked to that have, you know, a million safe miles, accident-free. Um, they have tested out this type of technology. They feel very uncomfortable with it. Um, they don't like the, the kind of the, the jerking things that it, that it does, and they just don't like not being in control. So to mandate a technology from a driver who has been safe for the past 20 years or plus out on the road and now tell them they have to now use something that makes them uncomfortable out on the road seems problematic. And um, that's basically the issue. So if you're a driver out there that feels that way, you know, you got about a month uh, to get this information in, go to landline.media, find out the, the docket number and file your comments. I'm just blown away by the concept of like ignoring not only people in the industry, but also other agencies saying, hey, the information that we're receiving points in the exact opposite direction you're heading. But so it goes in the government sometimes. Now, Ryan, you recently uh, did some coverage on a recent scam uh, involving DOT numbers. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So Crystal Minardi, she is in our uh, licensing and permits department. I'm fairly certain I got that correct. So either way, Crystal uh, was sharing with us about a temporary adjustment that FMCSA has recently made to the MCS 150 update uh, policy. So if you are filling that out, 
via the manual form. Now, if you're doing it online, this doesn't apply to you, but if you're filling out the manual form, FMCSA is now requiring that you submit a copy of your CDL to them to verify that you are, in fact, who you say you are. They can look it up and say, hey, the DOT number belongs to you know Joe Smith. Here's Joe Smith's ID. Link the two together, and we can let you do the update. The door that has opened, however, is that there are some fraudulent brokers and, and some, some shady actors out there who are on load boards who will ask drivers for a copy of their CDL before allowing them to book a load through that broker. What they then do is take that copy of the CDL, turn around and update your MS-150 information. They use that to be you know, the verifying evidence that they needed to get control of that number. Then they hijack the number, change all the information. They essentially now control your number and can book loads, double broker loads, oh, do wow. all sorts of nefarious things that can certainly put carriers at a real, real disadvantage. And Crystal said that this is something that can inflict so much you know, financial damage mm. that it could ruin some small business owner mm -hmm. operators. And so, you know, it's something to definitely be vigilant about. That was her number one thing that she continued to go back to is that once this happens, there's not a lot you can do. You can fill out, you know, complaints on the National Consumer Complaint Database. You can file a complaint with FMCSA. You can obviously reach out to law enforcement or, you know, local DOTs and things like that. But it, it all amounts to not a lot that you can do from the financial end of it. And you still kind of wind up with that liability. So in order to avoid some of that, the best thing you can do is just continue to be vigilant. Obviously, she's going to tell you, Go on FMCSA's uh, Safer website. Mm -hmm. Check out the broker's information there. You can obviously uh, do a credit check. That's free that we offer to OOIDA members. So if you're interested in that, you can contact the business services department here at OOIDA, and they will walk you through some of those things. Even if you just have questions or concerns about, yeah. hey, I don't think this is right. Something's, you know, this feels a little off to me. Give OOIDA's business services uh, department a call. They're going to be able to help you out with that. So, yeah, but just continue to be vigilant. And, again, she stressed to me that a, a legitimate broker is never going to ask for a copy of that CDL. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I, I, I just to add in, I think that's so important to for members take advantage of that. You know, mm -hmm. call in OIDA if you have questions about this, whether it's this tough sort of thing, lease purchases. Have have somebody look over this. I mean, I think a lot of times that can be forgotten. Um, that that's you know that's just another one of of the perks that OIDA can have is just there's you know they have real experts on these sort of issues. So take advantage of them. Well, and I think the more stories that I do about this and I talk to people in our you know regulations and. Business, Business services and permits and licensing department. It's it, it's confusing to me how we have all of these resources and yet it continues to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, look, I'm not trying to you know say anything bad about anybody out there, but I think that the problem is, is that you know you lose sight of it sometimes, yeah. and when you lose that sight, yeah. that's all it takes is just that little bit of crack mm -hmm. in the door for them to sneak on in. Yeah. Now, Mark, uh, we learned recently that the White House plans to keep Julie Sue as acting labor secretary. Can you talk to me more about this? And is there a possibility that she could stay in that role until the end of this this term? Yeah, well, I mean, that that's what uh, it appears the White House uh, plan is. And so to kind of back up on this back um, all the way in February, uh, President Biden uh, nominated uh, Julie Sue, who was the uh, deputy secretary at the time to, uh, you know, to be the next uh, labor secretary after Marty Walsh left. During this time, she has uh, been serving as acting uh, secretary for the past, you know, several months. Um, meantime, you know, she went through her confirmation hearing. Um, they have not put it up to a vote. And the reason they haven't put it up to a vote is because it's pretty clear they don't have the votes to confirm her. But since she's acting secretary and was uh, the deputy secretary, um, theoretically, technically, they're able to just let her just never put it up to a vote. And, um, you know, and just let her continue out as acting secretary. Now, we're already seeing uh, groups saying, hey, but if you try to pass some regulations and some rulemakings this way, we're going to come back and challenge this, that this wasn't a permanent secretary doing this. Um, you know, uh, a big part of the reason uh, that, that uh, Julie Sue 
uh, doesn't look like she's going to be confirmed uh, by senators uh, is her history with, uh, you know, the worker classification law, AB5. Um, I know that's something obviously OIDA has been involved in, in lawsuits on, on that as well, uh, you know, taking away uh, the ability uh, for, you know, owner operators to continue their business model is, is a big concern in, in California. And she used to be the California labor secretary. Um, so she had a pivotal role in that. And there is concern that, you know, they're looking to roll out a new worker classification law. Um, and so a lot of groups are challenging, hey, if you're going to try to do that um, as a uh, you know, acting secretary, uh, there may be some legal challenges there. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. It, it certainly doesn't seem, uh, from my opinion, uh, how things should work. Uh, you shouldn't be able to just keep her in the role when you know that you need senators con- to confirm. And we already know. <laughs> Seems like it makes the confirmation process largely useless. Yeah. I mean, so in this, so it's definitely, uh, I think it's problematic and, and an issue, but I guess we'll just uh, uh, get our popcorn ready and see how this plays out. Well, and I know, Mark, like you had mentioned, obviously Biden last week had, had basically said that my commitment to her is unwavering. And yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to back down from this. Like, at what point can the opposition basically try to force the hand and say we need another nomination for this? Well, you know, I, I think I think they're trying, but the but the but the issue is, I think technically uh, they are allowed. I think that the key point, uh, you know, may come from if they decide they won't be able to accomplish anything for the rest of this term, you know, and if that if that's what happens, uh, then maybe they'll they'll pivot. But uh, at least right now, uh, I think that they're going to try to keep the status quo and maybe try to, uh, you know, overturn the votes uh, backdoor of a, of a couple of these senators and and hope that they can get it done that way. All right. Now to the story that I assume everyone is staying listening for. <laughs> Bated breath. Really. The, the, the votes are in, and we know who the sexiest trucker is in Kentucky and Indiana. That's right. Well, it's a tri-state region, which was confusing because they continued to say Kentucky and Indiana, which I don't know if you guys are great at math. That's that's two states, not, not three. Yeah, I, and I was going to say that, but then I, yeah. I'm not great at geography, thought, so I'm not going to question no. things. But uh, congratulations to one Justin Castle. He won uh, WBKR's She Thinks Her Trucker's Sexy Contest. They were announcing the top five throughout this week, and I— We'll let you know every morning I woke up. You've been was, on this beat. That like... was the first thing I looked for <laughs> was who is today's sexy trucker. And let me tell you what, it was a handful of real lookers that took home these crowns. But I did speak to uh, Barb Berge. She is the promotions director at WBKR uh, in uh, Owensboro, Kentucky. And she told me this is year five for them doing this, by the way. Hasn't always been truckers. It first started out as farmers, then they went to plumbers, and now they're on to truckers. She said this is the biggest response they've gotten out of any of the professions. Truckers by far blew them away. There were over 50 nominations. There was also a, a dog that got nominated. He did not place in the top five. There were several women though that were in, uh, on in yeah. the nominations not a single lady placed in the top five oh, wow. just throwing that out there i don't know what hmm. that says about I, anything you can read into I, however you like i was just happy to see how much fun a lot of the truckers had with it the sprawled out over the uh, the hood oh yeah laying on the flatbed was, with the little you know there was, i guess you couldn't see that yeah but, you know, it was a finger to the lip as somebody with not the best uh, physique these days uh, i i certainly appreciate it hey, good it was it was kind of validating yeah. i'm like see i can be sexy too <laughs> yeah well, Ryan, we do appreciate you uh, keeping up on that. And I expect I next do what year. I can. Did she say what they were going to do next year? She, or? she thinks she's going to go back to the well of truckers again. They, right. Again, it was such a great response. I told her we need to, you know, work our connections and take this thing national, maybe even put together a calendar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm an I idea mean, man. I'm just throwing these out here for me. I'm sure it's appreciated. <laughs> she All seemed right. to appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having us again. Yeah, absolutely. All right. For the latest news, you can check out Landline.media. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackbird. Stay tuned for more after this. For catness accuracy, weigh your truck on a cat scale. When you weigh on a cat scale, you get a no-excuses guarantee. You can now save time weighing by using your smartphone. Find out more at weighmytruck.com. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. 
Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline now. Welcome back. A lot has happened over the past few days with Yellow and UPS. To get the latest on the situation and how it's impacting freight, Ken Adamo joins me. He is the Chief of Analytics for DAT. Ken, can you give me an overview of what's happening and how that's impacting the freight market and owner-operators? Sure, let's start with Yellow. So, Yellow has been in some financial trouble uh, recently, and it seems as though they are unable or they are running out of options to find solutions to remedy that financial distress. So the reporting um, in major media outlets suggests that they are limiting, if not ceasing, pickups, and they are eyeing offloading their logistics division, ultimately in steps that will culminate in likely bankruptcy filing next week to wind down the business. From an impact perspective, um, there's two real impacts. If you think about how LTL networks work, you have the P&D and you have the line hall. There's, of course, all of the back office, dock and yard work. But speaking strictly to transportation, uh, the P&D uh, volume will likely be handled by existing LTL capacity. It's a pretty low point in the market. Um, most of the large nationals and regionals that operate in Yellow's footprint will be able to pick up that volume or already have, quite frankly. On the line haul side, I do think that is an opportunity for small fleets um, and owner-operators to pick up some volume as these large LTL networks are probably pushed over their line haul capacity. So that's hub-to-hub type moves of the bulk LTL. Mainly, I would suggest moving on the economy side of things, less on the priority side. And as far as UPS goes, what's the, the current status of that and how is that, how is that impacting things? So the, thankfully, they've reached a tentative agreement with the Teamsters. That was announced this week. And all along, the plan has been if there's a tentative agreement in place, there will not be a work stoppage on August 1st while they work through ratification, which took, could take a couple weeks. I will say there's a non-trivial chance that the deal is not ratified. There were some major negotiating points that were important to the rank and file that apparently didn't make it into the final deal. I think the probability of that is very low, but not zero. So if the deal were to not be ratified, then we would be talking again about a work stoppage at UPS. One of the big sticking points is pathway from part-time to full-time and some of the benefits related to non-full-time route drivers. Now, looking at the bigger picture, what effect could the wage increases and better conditions that these huge carriers and companies have? So obviously, it's a great thing for the drivers that work at those firms, right? I think we all believe trucking is a very important industry. It's a very taxing job. So I think first and foremost, being a massive proponent of this industry and passionate about it, I think it's a great thing to see those folks getting increases in their pay. I think secondarily, what that means is we all know that trucking is a rather low margin business. So someone's going to have to pay for it. And to someone in this case is most likely going to be shippers. You know, we've seen pretty substantial driver pay increases at, at some of the intermodal and truck point-to-point truckload firms throughout COVID that have all pretty much stuck and been passed along to the shipper. So I think that's really the environment that these type of increases. And keep in mind, too, right? these are structured, layered, sequential increases that a lot of these firms have negotiated. So it's not all at once. So when you see something like a, a 10 or a $20 per hour pay increase, that's layered in over the life of the contract, which could be five to seven, um, and in some cases with certain companies, 10 years. But it gives the drivers and the dock workers and, and other folks security as inflation is running hotter than it has typically, that they will be made whole as the price of everything around them gets more expensive. But it is certainly going to lead its way to um, higher prices to shippers. I saw an article that said UPS shippers could face double-digit rate increases. If that does happen, will that effect be felt down the line? I think a couple things are going to be felt down the line. You know, it's expensive to run a multi-channel 
small parcel, small package and parcel uh, fulfillment network, right? I mean, coming from that world, it is much cheaper to single source, right? Because if you're a primary with UPS, the volume you're going to need to give to FedEx to get any kind of remote discount is going to be substantial, which means you're shipping less with UPS, and almost all of these discounts are volume-based, right? So I think what you're seeing is a lot of these labor scares, a lot of these service scares, a lot of shippers are really reconsidering or taking action on their sole provider or their single source strategy, and that will impact downstream, right? FedEx has a dramatically different behind-the-scenes network, still public, but just sort of the thing that you don't realize when you drop a package in a box in front of your bank. FedEx buys substantially more on the purchase transportation markets than UPS. Their networks are very different. Um, so if, if more volume is shuffled around, and then I think once you get past the, the, the purple versus brown debate, there's been this huge rise with e-commerce and COVID of regional parcel and small package, on track, laser ship, companies like that. So I think what you're seeing there is more fragmentation at the tail end of the market, which again, I think all of those things provide opportunities to smaller fleets. And it's not easy necessarily to get in with a FedEx or a UPS as a line haul provider in the purchase transportation network. But when you get into some of the regional or some of the more distantly served areas of these networks, as things become more decentralized or at least more fragmented, that will provide opportunities for fleets outside of the large fleets. What can owner operators do um, to prepare if similar issues arise in the future? You gotta be ready, right? I mean, I think it's the old Boy Scout or maybe still the, the current Boy Scout motto, but I, I think it holds true. These markets are turning faster than ever. If we look at the last five freight cycles, we define a freight cycle as a full up and down market cycle, usually 18 to 24 months, or historically 18 to 24 months. We're seeing both the peaks and the valleys get higher and lower, and we're seeing the distance between the freight cycles shorten. What's that mean? More volatility, right? Things used to move a lot slower. They're moving much faster now. So I think having the right capacity in the right place at the right price well, that's always great general advice. As markets move more quickly, um, as disruptions become more common, being in the right place at the right time for the right price is going to be crucially important for smaller fleets. What is the biggest concern when it comes to these companies threatening to strike? I think the fragility of supply chain networks is absolutely the number one concern. You know, COVID has helped shippers and, frankly, large car- like the large closed networks, the hub-and-spoke networks, realized that just in time got a little too just, right? So the fragility of these networks, the lack of slack for a terrible pun, is not something that a lot of folks are going to be able to tolerate as disruptions become more common, right? So if at any moment, 5 to 10%, right? So yellow represents 5% of total LTL volume, uh, 5 to 10%, depending on how you kind of calculate your estimates. That's $5 billion worth of LTL. I think it's over a billion pounds worth of freight. If that's seemingly going to go away and there's no real mechanism for the market to absorb that, that's going to put shippers in the lurch. And it's also if carriers aren't ready to absorb it, they're going to miss out on a great opportunity to capture that volume, right? Someone needs to move that freight. Whoever's most flexible and most able to adapt will secure it. So I think that's really the big um, learning over the past few years and certainly now, right? Because we've had a potential major strike at the rail, potential major strikes at the ports, and now the largest transportation company in the world seemingly narrow, narrowly avoided, avoided a strike. So I think that's front of mind for a lot of people around the criticality of the supply chain. Is there anything else uh, that you want to add that I may have missed that's important? I mean, I think the value of data, right? I mean, I'm obviously a little bit biased given my title and kind of my passion towards the space, but data sounds inaccessible to some small fleet owners or smaller shippers or smaller brokers. But ultimately, that's the currency um, that's being traded out there that's allowing certain companies to succeed and certain companies to fall behind. And it doesn't have to always be numbers data or data in the spreadsheet. Staying abreast of what's happening, uh, listening to avail- you know, the information that's available for free out there, both in the media and in social media, I think has allowed a lot more people to stay a lot more connected to what's happening. And it's allowed them to really take advantage of a lot more opportunities. All right. Wonderful. Ken, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. That was Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics for DAT, talking about the current situation with Yellow and UPS. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. That's the end of our show. Thank you for tuning in. Please join us again tomorrow. Have a great night and stay safe.
I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com. <laughs> 